He's a very sweet Canadian guy who was a contestant on Canadian Idol called Will Blunderfield. Just got off the phone with him and I just thought, what a sweet young man. But drinks his own piss and not just his own piss, as it turns out. There's a whole video where he's like, and it's got a little bit of pre-cum in it. And we had a long discussion about whether or not that was just simply too unpleasant a phrase to be airing on Radio 4 when people might be having their breakfast. We decided we were going to keep it in. How did you get interested in thinking about modern gurus? I wonder where the inspiration kind of came from, but I, I think I've always been a journalist who's been interested in the weirder parts of the internet. So I've spent a lot of time. I remember early in the 2000s um, when I just come out of being a teenager, I spent a lot of time in body modification communities. There was a site called BME Zine, which was um, run by a kind of crazy Canadian called Shannon Lara. And it was all full of either people having these really weird experimental tattoos and piercings or actually in quite a lot of cases like hammering nails through their nuts. Um, so from the very start, my interaction with the internet was a lot about being in the kind of weirder spaces. And I've always really enjoyed reporting on subcultures. So it does feel kind of slightly strange to me that I'm right at the end of my thirties and I'm still doing like, let's explain the internet to people. Um, you know, and I thought we might've got past that by now, but it is still a, it is still a viable job in journalism and a really fun and interesting job in journalism. Okay. And gurus are now their own subculture, m many multiple subcultures on the internet in your opinion? Well, every sort of, I think, pretty much every interesting sphere on the internet has its own set of gurus. And there are lots that I didn't get to in the series. You know, parenting is a really interesting one, right? I think when people are at moments of precarity or anxiousness, they want someone to tell them what to do or want someone to assure them that they've been through the same thing. Um, and, you know, more and more of our connections are moving online. My big analysis of the last 20 years is we used to have these geographic communities, you know, you used to have to be friends with whoever lived in your town. And that's moved much more to most of our socialising based around interest communities. And so what you have is that you might not know the people who live in your street, but you know all the other furries or whatever it might be. I don't know if there are any furry gurus. I should just clarify. I'm mean, sure there are, but I don't personally know of them. But, you know, parenting or wellness or productivity or whatever it might be, all the bits of your life, whether it's dating or working, money making, who do we look to for advice now? Actually, it's, sometimes it's our friends, but just as often it's someone on the internet. I suppose... As soon as you allow people to choose their own subculture, whatever it is that one person's going to get obsessed by and find interesting or compelling or whatever, there is inevitably going to be a person that is most effective at capturing the attention of the people who like that stuff. And they are then going to have incentives that align to encourage them to give out advice. Sometimes those incentives could be financial. Other times they could be genuinely altruistic. Here is a unique medical condition that very few people have dealt with, and I have actually managed to find out a way that the medical system hasn't seen. And here, here is a potential solution for you, and then people are going to hail them, and everything in between, from useful to useless. Yeah, I mean, ch childbirth and NCT groups, right? National childbirth groups are a really interesting example of that in the real world, which is that people who have just had a baby or just about to have a baby want a huge amount of advice and their friends aren't necessarily going through the same experience at the same time and sort of aren't that interested. So they seek out these childbirth groups. However, if you ever have a friend who goes through that process, get ready for them to complain about the fact that there will be lots of, you know, people creeping into that who will be, for example, you know, very anti-bottle feeding, for example, or might have very odd opinions on childhood vaccines. And yeah, as you say, there is always the problem of the kind of the kind of it's like the sound of I won't don't want to be a member of any club that would have me kind of thing. Right. Anybody who wants to be listened to, by definition, you should probably be quite suspicious of um, because those people, you know, like narcissists self-select very heavily. Mm. Where did the gurus come from then? Is it a natural emergence, in your opinion, or are people seeing the opportunity to jump on the back of a bandwagon? How many of them are altruistic versus how many of them are um pre-prepared looking at this as an opportunity to give make a name for themselves that's a really good question because actually one of the things that consistently comes up along across the series is the number of people who try and reinvent themselves across a number of different domains so one of the people we talk about episode six is about something called day game which is a pickup artist technique where you chat up you're smiling in a way that implies you've already had an interaction with this community but for those who haven't um, you know, you try and pick up women on, on the street and get them into bed very quickly. And one of the guys who was very big in this in the 2000s, late 2000s, early 2010 was a guy called Tom Torero. And it was interesting talking to people who'd known him before he was Tom Torero when he was a guy called Tom Ralish. He was at Oxford. He was a fairly nerdy percussion student. But he had been very much like a new atheist debate bro. Um, and he then he, he'd completely fallen out of love with that and he'd become very religious. And he went and actually interviewed Richard Dawkins and felt that he'd really smacked Richard Dawkins down. 
And that made me laugh because in the previous episode about the IDW, I'd spoken to James Lindsay. Now, James Lindsay is, I think, let me get this the right way around. I think his middle name is actually Stephen, but his pen name is James A. Lindsay because he started out as a new atheist writer in the American South, again, in the new atheist wave. Does that make sense? And like the A and the S are next to each other on the keyboard. So this was his like Superman Clark Kent level of disguise about who he really was. But he started out as a new atheist and now he's, you know, funded by Christian conservatives. And, you know, you can see someone like Majid Nawaz, another member of the IDW, right? Starts off in Hizbut Tahir, uh, an Islamist organization, then, become, you know, is now a kind of big anti-vaxxer. And I think some people, I call it like after the bacteria, I call them extremophiles. You know, they're just very att attracted to these big intellectual movements, whatever's the kind of zeitgeisty thing now, and being a kind of thought leader in it. And that's interesting to me because I think most people probably have more fixed opinions and want to succeed in that sphere. Whereas there are some people who are, who like the need comes first, the need to be validated, the need to be listened to, the need to be important comes first. And then they pour themselves into all the different bottles and see which one feels like the best fit. Did you consider looking at Brian Rose from London Real? I did not. Tell me about Brian you Rose from missed, London Real. You've missed a trick. So Brian Rose is, I would say, the most successful serial grifter on the internet. Um, or perhaps the most unsuccessful, given the fact that everybody knows it's a grift. I was going to say, the fact that you're calling him a grifter indicates that things have not gone well for Brian Rose of late. If there was a... He's had a sort of 50-year face plant, basically, just permanent. Every birthday, it's just some new grift, and it's failed again. Um, he started off doing podcasting a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago, basically. <clears throat> him and his business partner were watching uh, Joe Rogan. They really liked it. They decided to do their own thing. Um, this only just recently came out, but he kind of screwed the business partner over, took the project for his own. <clears throat> he starts doing this business. He then gets introduced to Dan Pena, the trillion dollar man, who, as far as I can see, is a, just a loud, angry, sweary, grumpy old dude that wears suits and big ties that look like something from Mad Men. <laughs> He ran for the mayor of London. He created his own independent freedom platform so he could broadcast live streams with David Icke during the middle of COVID. He uh, is now doing decentralized finance, DeFi-like things, and is mm -hmm. republishing podcasts that he recorded four or five or six years ago to make it look like the people who used to have on are coming back on so that they still think that he's relevant. It's impossible to unsubscribe from his email list. Anybody that's listening to this, do not subscribe to his email list because th that is like the worst venereal disease that you can think of. It's just never getting off you. And right. I like this. This is the Chris Williamson's GDPR complaint section of the podcast. Correct. Yeah. That's very correct. Yeah. I God, if I could, if I knew how to submit to GDPR, Brian would be. I mean, I'm behind a very long list of people that have got grievances with him. My point being. Every single different opportunity that has come up where there has been a chance for him to inject himself into something that looks opportunistic, um, there's always a financial incentive. There's always an in-group, out-group, tribalism thing going on. It's them versus us. They're trying to shut down free speech or they're trying to tell us what to do. They're not for the people in politics. They're trying to control your money. Each one of them has got the same like cadence and rhythm and fundamental feel to it. And yet he just, can, he, one of them fails. He got less votes in the London mayoral election than that guy that has the bin on his head. But was Count Binface. Count Binface, yeah. Like Binny McBinface. He got fewer votes than that guy. Um, got told off because he was going around London in a bus that had his face on the side of it, live streaming from the bus as he was going around. And then the police came over and said, you can't do this. It's fucking lockdown. He said, as you can see, the current mayor of London is trying to stop our campaign. I'm like, Brian, you're not being victimized. You're just a prick. Like, that's what's going on. Um, <laughs> Honestly, they, they, I would like to say that to, I would say, approximately 4% of the internet yeah. need to be told you're not being victimized. You're just an asshole. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. The, the people don't hate you because you've got hidden truths. People hate you because you're repellent. Yes. And I just yeah. think people would be happier if, if that was something that was said more often. My point being, I can see what you mean. There are certain... Um, uh, rhythms and, and, and trends that occur and, and people inject. And that's not for me to say that, you know, every single person is as bad as Brian. Like Brian is about as no, a hundredth percentile as you can get with regards to this. But some people feel compelled to put themselves into a movement 
and they're obsessive, dedicated individuals, and that shows up throughout their entire career of whatever it is that they do. Another good example would be Michael Saylor, who I encountered through crypto, you might have heard of. You know, he's now got laser eyes on Twitter and he's a he's a crypto guru. And you go back a little bit into his history and he's best known for having lost six billion dollars in a single day during the dot com crash. Six. I'm, and I had to go like, check, is that a typo? Do you mean six million? And it was like, no, no, no. He was worth allegedly 10 billion and he got by the end of the day is worth three point nine billion. And I just think in my big list of people I would take financial advice for, I'd probably all the people who haven't lost six billion dollars in a single day would be higher on the list than Michael Saylor. But but that's but that's no bar. Like that's one of the things I find really interesting about that space is there's almost a kind of idea that if you're flawed, it's more authentic. You know, so you get these dating gurus who don't find love themselves. You get these productivity gurus who are working themselves into the ground. And and that we don't want to hear necessarily from people who have got it all figured out. We find that kind of annoying. You want to hear from somebody who's struggling like you are. Hmm. That's interesting. I, based on my experience, I would say the people that seem to be the most flawless that are viewed by their audience Now, as long as they're flawless now, that's fine. If they're flawed now, they're going to get called out because there is an incentive amongst the audience for them to continually pick holes, right? Derek from More Plates, More Dates recently released this big documentary about the Liver King. I had him on. He made it with my housemate, Zach. They're both out in Sacramento at the moment recording, blah, blah, blah. Derek did a training vlog with one of my friends. Derek knows more about hormones and TRT and supplements and all of that stuff than pretty much anybody else on the planet, right? Someone saw him doing a training vlog and decided to break down his training style and lambast him for the fact that he doesn't know how to train. Why? Because he is somebody that has sort of this purer, purest white snow, unfettered uh, reputation when it comes to certain domains. And as soon as there's the opportunity for someone to pick a hole in it, they've been able to do it because they've said that he doesn't know what he's doing when it comes to training. My point being that when I think about the productivity world, right, which is a, a big part of my history. And also there wasn't a single person on the episode you did on productivity that I haven't had on this podcast. Not a single person wasn't. So, but all of those people- That's because they're all very productive. They do a lot of podcasts. They they put themselves out there. That's correct. But if you were to look at Ali Abdal, Ali very rarely opens up about his own current vulnerabilities when it comes to productivity. Like, yeah, he'll have problems, but his problems will be significantly better dealt with than yours are because he's just a a, a superior productivity guy. I don't think people would have followed him had he have had right now the issues. Someone that's got a story, a backstory. In my opinion, people don't want to follow gurus that right now are struggling through things. They like the idea of a narrative because it creates that I was where you are, you can be where I am. Um, But I'm not convinced that it would be like I'm watching you fail forward right now because why am I listening to you? Why wouldn't I just listen to someone who's more perfect, even if it's untruthful? That's interesting. So I wonder with the liver king, you know, and this idea that, oh, I can get all these gains by just eating my raw organs. Oh, no, actually, it was human growth hormone. Do you think that will affect his sales of his goat organ pills or his bull organ pills, or whatever he's selling? Like, that's the thing. It ought, to my mind, to be a huge blow to his credibility. And I'm just not sure that it will. One of the problems you have is he's so successful and has so much momentum at the moment. And it was already primed. The paleo movement and the ancestral health movement was already rattling along. So how do you slow that down? Even if you were to chop his growth in half, let's say that all of the damage that's been done from, you know, Rogan, me, Zach, and Derek over the weekend, let's say that that chops his growth in half. He's still growing more than almost every other business on the planet. And now he's doing another podcast tour where he's apologizing for everything. He was on Andrew Schultz yesterday. They had to Febreze the couch that I sat on yesterday to get rid of the smell of the liver king so that I could sit down in a room that didn't honk like organ meats. That well, I was, was going to say, what, do, what does the liver king smell like? Does he smell well, of bull's Febreze testicles? Is far, is, uh, Febreze as far as I'm aware, but um, they did have to f- get the air conditioner out to, to do that. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to slow down. Um, but, I mean, he's, he's a, another guy. He's seen an opportunity to inject himself in. There's heavy financial opportunity here. Why not have the answers? His apology video was incredible because it was one of those bits. Remember that bit in... Um, Blackadder goes forth when they, like, he's doing the summing up speech when Blackadder's on trial. Sorry, you're probably too young to remember this. No, but no, no, it, it, it ends with like, he is guilty. And then he, he doesn't turn over the page. And then the other page is guilty only of caring too much. And that was how I felt like his apology video was, right? It's like, I yes, I am guilty only of caring too much about young men. I just wanted to be perfect for you. And that's why I had to dope myself. Wants was, to prevent male suicide, classic. takes right. Winstrol and 
Decker. That was his solution for it. And so, okay, okay, what is the need that gurus are tapping into? Like, is there a, are there individual or, or common trends in the need that gurus tap into? I think part of it is the desire for reassurance that everything's going to be okay. So the last episode is about looking into the future. And if you think about all the different roles we have in the um, in our culture about people to look into the future, it's everything from the super kind of scientific, like super forecasters through meteorologists, through trend forecasters in fashion, all the way out to tarot and fortune telling and astrology. And all of it's about the idea that you just want somebody to kind of listen to your problems and tell you it'll be okay or like give you some idea of control. Um, and wanting to get some kind of a grip over a world that can feel very scary. And this is part of my thesis about it is that, you know, we're seeing a decline of people identifying as religious, huge decline in the UK in the last census. Um, and, you know, you don't go to your priest for advice like you probably would have done in 1850. So who do you go to? So it's certainty in an uncertain world. Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. And I also think, you know, like the pickup artists are really interesting because I think one of the reasons they flourish is because the feeling that that the idea of how you date somebody has changed, like what people want from a relationship, what they expect from a relationship has really changed. And it's hard not to see quite a lot of that stuff as a backlash to feminism, right? The idea that what do women want in a relationship? Do they actually really want all this independence or is it in some ways making them unhappy? That's the message that you get from a lot of those manosphere dating gurus. Yeah, I mean, that's an entire rabbit hole that i've spent an awful lot of this year thinking about you know yeah Um, how challenging is it for women who've only recently just been given parity in education and employment to find out that most of their relationship outcomes are negatively correlated with leaning into that education and employment women as they earn more and become better educated reduce the potential dating pool of men that they're going to fundamentally be attracted to. On average, women want to date men that are better educated and better employed than they are. So it's the tall girl problem, right? If you're a six foot two girl, you're stuck only dating professional athletes. Really, if you want to date a man that is taller than you on average, which is what women seem to want to do. And that's like hard. That's harsh on the guys that feel like they're being left behind. It's harsh on this group of women who finally just about achieved independence. And you're like, congratulations. Like, go and, go and finally be the person that you wanted to be without the restrictions of whatever predisposition people were saying that you had to have. But now you're stuck sort of fighting for this group of turbo chads at the top that are going to maybe uh, a wealth of options doesn't encourage them to behave in an appropriate manner, right? So you have sort of heartbroken and wistful women. You have lonely and sort of forgotten men. And then you have these guys at the top. I don't think it's particularly good for them either, although it may be in the moment. It's probably not existentially for their soul in the long term. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a, a fascinating question. But when you do not have answers, you need to look to somebody that's got certainty. And one of the ways that I've been able to identify, I think, some of the more guru-esque figures are people who – weaponize in-group and out-group dynamics yeah people who speak with absolute certainty and very rarely use caveats if you have somebody that has both of those things that for me is a huge huge red light and that is brian rose from london real this is the way that the world is it's them that are trying to shut us down they are the ones that are trying to stop this we are together in a movement it's like you don't care about us you don't care about any us you're trying to identify the most easy them that you can because binding people together over the mutual hatred of an out group is significantly easier than binding them together over the mutual love of an in group oh yeah no i completely buy that and actually our mutual friend chris kavanagh of um decoding the gurus whose podcast you went on as a writer reply you know he and matt brown have this very good guruometer which i only discovered after i'd pitched this series i'm very glad about it because i really feel like i would have wholesomely ripped it off otherwise but the idea of these kind of big pseudo profound ideas of the kind of conspiracy thinking like and of the kind of financial milking you know to me that's a sign of a bad guru so i think you're right at what you said earlier on about the fact that some people are genuinely motivated because they want to help other people there are good gurus right just as there are good priests rabbis imams but those positions of authority carry innate dangers to them and one of them is absolutely the idea that you have to create a kind of shared enemy and the really interesting thing about that is to talk about the idw you know i i was thinking about this quite a lot because as you may have known i've had a few cancellation brushes myself and it does it is a quite a powerful experience that makes you feel quite sympathetic to people who've been in the other situation and i think if you're going to talk about anything that created the idw it was the idea that they'd all got a shared enemy in the quote unquote woke that was a more powerful thing you know uniting people with very very disparate political opinions but 
they could all agree that journalists from the New York Times and Slate and Vox were very annoying. And that's basically what bound them all together. What is your postmortem on the IDW? I think it's a real shame because I do think it did identify some things that were important. I, I definitely do feel that American journalism in particular became very polarized and there wasn't a big middle. You know, one of the things I like about living in Britain and having the BBC, you know, I go on question time and I have to sit next to Nigel Farage and the leftmost wing of the Labour Party and to complete other, you know, someone from the SNP, someone from Ply Cymru, whatever it might be. People, you have to be in the same space as having those conversations together. And that just doesn't happen in American journalism. You don't get somebody who's Fox and somebody's MSNBC forced to share a space very often. Um, so I like the fact that the IDW was pointing out the fact that actually there were lots of things that liberal institutions, liberal media institutions were missing, and they needed to be a bit more open-minded about that. That said, I do think a lot of them were either straightforward conservatives who therefore didn't really, they weren't really heterodox, they were just conservative. Someone like Ben Shapiro has a pretty consistent conservative outlook and there were some people in there who had some personality issues <laughs> should i say that is that, a, is that a kind way of saying it that, that you know that some of their their fighting and combative spirit actually kind of came from a kind of restlessness within them rather than maybe necessarily being such an intellectual idea one of the problems that you definitely have is when somebody gets a significant amount of clout for being good in one particular domain or having a take which seems to be particularly accurate it's very easy to get out over your skis and to then start commenting on stuff that you don't. I mean, uh, this story from Douglas Murray, who is a, a really good friend of mine, and he said someone asked him, somebody asked him something, something, something to do with COVID. Uh, this is a year ago, let's say. And uh, Douglas, Douglas said, I'm going to do something which is very rare in the modern world, which is not comment on something which I know nothing about. And you're like, there we are. Like, knowing or at least having the inclination that you have boundaries to your competence is something that is very important. And I think that you can end up in a situation where you you start commenting on stuff that you shouldn't do. Also, that being said, I would agree. I think that the IDW was a much needed uh, like vector of splintering somehow. Like it sort of injected itself... And sure enough, people made funny memes about it and there's like articles and all the rest of it. But it managed to inject itself and, and create a break point where people even now know what they mean by the intellectual dark web. Like you know the dynamic that you were referring to. And even if it's not something which had the legs to maintain its longevity longer term, perhaps it was an important sort of uh, like breaker switch or something that just kind of made people stumble over a little bit and go, actually, yeah, maybe we do need to be to see that there is a different way that things could be or something like that. Mm. It's funny you mentioned Douglas Murray because I have this weird, having been around in journalism now for so long, I have, I have all these people's little hinterlands stick in my mind. So I remember being an undergraduate at Oxford when, and Douglas Murray's a couple of years older than me, he was doing, I think, his PhD on Bosey, you know, Lord Alfred Douglas, Oscar Wilde's lover. And I've always sort of slightly wondered, how did you go from doing a lovely Victorian gay PhD into being like Douglas Murray of today. It's very exciting to me. It's like in the same way that I remember when Miley Yiannopoulos was a tech blogger at The Telegraph. And then you kind of watch his evolution I through all think, these other things. I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that Douglas's trajectory in Milo's has been quite as extreme. <laughs> I think No, that... no one has had as an extreme trajectory as Milo. I just, I'm always kind of fascinated by, I, you know, I think I've had a very boring and bland career, but just the fact that people just take these weird intellectual diversions is, is fascinating to me. Like that's the opportunities the internet gives you. Would you not say, so Douglas's The Madness of Crowds, a lot of that was about the collapse of grand narratives, that people no longer had the existing institutions and understanding of traditional wisdom that they would have relied on previously heavily coming in from religion is that not pretty much the same dynamic that you're describing here that it's it would be maybe more anthropological or ancestral wisdom but he's talking about people don't know what to do and in his view they were turning to a church of social justice as a solution to their problems yeah, I do buy that as a as a thesis. I do think that there is a comfort and security in knowing who your tribe is and and feeling that people have kind of got your back. Um, and you can either get that through explicitly religious settings or you can get it from social groups. So um, I haven't read Douglas's uh, book, but I understand people have, have found I said, it sold very well, which I respect, and that people have found lots of interesting stuff in it. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were parts of it I violently disagree with and parts of it which I heartily agree with. 
is it not, given the fact that there is such a lack of faith in institutions, especially when it comes to kind of understanding the world around you at the moment, uh, well, first off, where, where do you think that's come from? Like, why is it that there's such a, a lack of, of faith in them? I think a lot of it is, is to do with the democratizing power of the internet. And that, again, it's one of those double-edged swords, right? It's not a completely bad thing that now anybody can set themselves up as a podcast. You know, what is the version of you 20 years ago? Can you have this career or do you have to go through a much more formal process of going and working on like a local paper and then hoping that you'll get to go to Fleet Street because you've joined the right union, right? It doesn't, there is a good side to that in the fact that it has allowed far more voices to be heard. But some percentage of those voices are unfortunately going to be bad voices. And I think that's the bit we haven't really got to is working out that the fact that gatekeeping is not a completely dirty w word, but there was probably far too much gatekeeping in the media 20, 30 years ago. And we, we still haven't found the kind of right balance in that, to my mind. So given the fact that there is a lack of appropriate faith, and I think it's well justified, I mean, if... If anybody wanted a nail in the coffin of faith in the institutions, the last three years would have managed to do it with politicians and media types just putting their foot in their mouth and face planting on it just permanently, rolling back previously stated absolutes and so on and so forth. Why not have people come through? Someone needs to come through. The alternative is for people to just be bereft out at sea with no idea what to do. Is it better to have some advice that's hit and miss? Or is it better to have no advice at all? Right, but you've got to have a self-correcting mechanism. And the great joy of science and what the scientific revolution gave us was an idea that you were engaged in a collective struggle towards the truth and you would get things wrong along the way, but that you would be part of a community of scientists who would review your work and you know, they would pick you up when you went wrong. And the great Max Planck saying, you know, science advances one funeral at a time was a recognition of the fact that there was an unfortunate level of consensus that often meant that, you know, it was about people's personalities rather than how well they had interpreted stuff. But the idea was that science did still progress. And the same thing happens in an institution. You know, I work in the Atlantic and America magazine. And when I write a print piece for them, it goes through extensive fact checkers. You know, they will go back and ask me for sources. They will go, you know, they will sometimes re-interview people to check that I've got things right you know there is a, a level of that and in the same way if I got something horribly wrong there would be an open transparent process of corrections and that's the ideal right sometimes that doesn't work the ideal is not that you never get anything wrong the ideal is you do everything you can to stop yourself getting things wrong and when you do get things wrong you correct them and you're transparent about it and that's what kind of annoys me I guess about some of the people who spend all their time slating the mainstream media, you know, I say this is a fully paid up MSM shill, but, you know, is that do they have similar levels of rigor and fact checking and then owning up and fessing up when they get wrong? Or do they just kind of go, oh, well, I, I was I was right spiritually or they would say that, wouldn't they? How is it the case if that's the sort of process that you go through at The Atlantic, that articles that come out in The Guardian and The New York Times manage to get published? I see almost on what seems to be a very regular basis, some insane titled thing talking about how the calories on the back of a bar of chocolate and how homophobic or whatever it is that the guardian's putting out like it, it seems it seems to me that a lot of the takes that they go through don't have that degree of rigor so it doesn't seem like mainstream media is protected by the uh rules and procedures necessarily that's funny you would pick two left-wing examples, because I would actually say that's a bigger problem on the right, the problem of disinformation. I think if you, um, as I did recently, I came back from America, I spent some time in Florida watching, you know, just the average evening viewing of Fox News, right? That is an incredibly narrative-driven um, product and manages to create these whole ideas out of kind of whole cloth, which are really interesting, that people just kind of become fixated on this very narrow idea that everyone should be talking about without any kind of underlying idea of what what the actual I mean I'm, I'm thinking of Hunter Biden's laptop I'm also thinking of critical race there I'm also thinking of the short-lived crusade against ESG and pensions but you know they are kind of narrative machines as much as their deliveries of fact so I don't think it's a unique problem on the left at all and I think what you're probably identifying is opinion pieces rather than straight news reporting that's people having oh, yeah, calories that are, be, calories but... are homophobic is a, is a bad opinion not necessarily bad facts is it i mean well, are both. calories homophobic it's, probably. I, I don't know it's both but yeah i mean I, I think that what that shows is the echo chamber of whatever the algorithm likes to serve me is bringing up the most egregious transgressions that it sees from the left that it'll it'll pop up libs of tiktok and it'll pop up whatever else 
Um, but I imagine that there must be a like rights of TikTok as well. There must be an equivalent account for the transgressions that come from the other side of the fence. Yeah, that's interesting. I, d- I mean, there are media monitoring services, you know, there's media matters and stuff like that. I can't think of anyone that does picks out random individuals. Like the thing that's the thing is, I have consumed libs of TikTok. I have laughed at at mad Americans um, saying stupid things about gender. We all have, uh, you know, it's okay. But I I can't think of a right wing a version of that that does it where it picks out individual right wing people. I guess maybe actually, in their heyday, things like the Daily Show and the Colbert Report did that. They used to go and interview some Trump supporters and they would set them up to make them look silly. And that was a kind of lo-fi, low-churn version of what Libs of TikTok did now. And actually, probably we should be similarly uncomfortable about that. And I, again, probably laughed at all of that in the 2000s in a way that probably made me feel quite uncomfortable now, that you're just picking individual normie people and holding them up as, as, as idiots to be kind of mocked by the crowd. In your opinion, then, is the mainstream media still putting out, on average the best content it's putting out better more accurate content than individual creators i mean it depends what you're talking about really i follow an enormous number of sub stacks and one of the reasons i really like doing that is i want to hear from the world nerdy expert in a particular topic about you know my friend john ellidge has got one where he writes about the transport policy and trains and just this you know in a level of detail you were simply not going to get in in the mainstream media because it's only interesting to a certain number of people and that has been really positive because as a journalist anywhere, really, even if you're a specialist, of course, you are to some extent a generalist. You have to make yourself an expert on things very quickly. I mean, I guess it speaks to a bit like what you do, right? You you have to interview an enormous number of people and you have to make your you have to master the subjects very quickly. And that's a tough thing to do. And it's a tough thing to get right and be, know what the probing questions are to ask. So there is that problem. And I do think individual creators can sometimes do better at that stuff, the really hardcore scrutiny. But there is a huge problem, and you definitely saw this with the IDW about who, you know, becoming essentially a version of regulatory capture, being captured by your audience where they only want one type of content and also becoming too chummy with your subjects. You know, one of the things that's interesting to me is that, you know, having done political journalism for so long is I'm quite critical of the lobby system, the press corps in the US. You know, the idea is there's great journalists working there, but you're spending all day and night with politicians. They're your sources. You can't burn them or screw them over. And that means you can't do very, you know, you would weigh up whether or not it's worth burning a relationship for to do a story. And it, and, and you have to, in order to be able to do that, you also have to have a paper that backs you um, and will deal with that, you know, the, the relationship with the Trump White House, or whoever it is being in flames. And also, you know, the advertisers aren't going to desert you. And I think that, you know, the thing is about in an institution like journalism is, is only really a collection of individuals, right? I can't take on Elon Musk. I can't stand up to Elon Musk and scrutinize his practices as me. What I can do is chip in my $20 a year towards a, a mainstream newspaper that can actually do that and can report and send writers to do it. And I think, it, you know, it's very fashionable to criticize the mainstream media. And rightly so. I've got my own many criticisms of it working within it. But there's an enormous amount of just shoe leather, very boring reporting. You know, who's the person who goes to the court case and sits through it all the way through? You know, who is the person who sits through the hours of Senate testimony and listens to all that stuff? You know, there are lots of ju- – the problem is that we we complain about the high-profile, annoying journalists and the kind of bedrock of people who go in, find things out day in and day out. We just actually don't talk about We just all rely on them to have – to kind of discover the facts on which the rest of us can all then have an argument. Is it not the case? Was that the stirring? Were you not stirred by that, Chris? Are you not? You know, I, do you not now concede that actually the the mainstream media, the hated mainstream media, might occasionally do some good? Well, it depends on whether you uh, what it is that you're reading and what you're exposed to, right? Because the stuff that most people will see will be the egregious examples. It'll be the Taylor Lorenz crying for the fifteenth time about whatever it is that she's recently done. And I realized a little while ago that. There's always been a dynamic where individual groups are categorized by the most extreme members that are within it, right? So previously it would have been that um, all Muslims are ISIS members, right? You know, that that's like a pretty old trope. Then it would be um, to do with everybody that's on the left is part of this sort of blue-haired SJW thing, or anybody that's on the right is a bigoted, homophobic, racist, blah, blah, blah. I think that there's an equivalent dynamic going on within individuals so you might have heard of something called the peak end rule. So peak end rule was found by Daniel Kahneman 
And what it suggests no. is that yeah. in, when you m remember an event, you remember the most extreme or the most intense part, and you also remember the end. So you remember the peak, you remember the end. And you did this. This is why if you give someone a colonoscopy, you should just leave it in at the end out. and Correct. not wiggle it about a bit. Yes. Correct. I, I, that, that was the study. That's that the bit that really stuck in my mind. Yeah. I'm sure enough. it did. And so what I've come to believe is that there is an equivalent rule for public figures in the world called the peak hate rule. So people are remembered by their worst transgression and by their most recent transgression, right? So uh, when thinking about Jordan Peterson, if you're a critic of his, you will see him as a transphobe that didn't call students by their preferred pronouns and someone that criticizes Sports Illustrated girls on the internet. If you think about Hassan Paika, you will think about a person who said America deserved 9-11 and someone who claims to be a socialist but now lives in a $5 million mansion in wherever the fuck it is that he lives, right? You have their worst transgression and you have their most recent transgression. That's what people are seen as. That's how much of the public views, in my opinion, big names that they see that exist like out there that creates stuff. And after a while, people no longer actually are seen as people. Like people don't see, the normal person doesn't see Joe Rogan as a person. They see him as an amalgamation of ideas. He's like a representation of an ideology fused into human form. It just happens to be that the human was there before and has always gone through. But that's why I think some of the dehumanizing language that gets used, because it doesn't feel like you're criticizing a person. It feels like it's some not like a deity, but like a, like a symbol almost, that that's what you're going for. And that's where I think the peak hate rule uh, sort of ties in a little bit as well. That's really interesting. I mean, I have a kind of weird perspective on this because I have one group of people on the internet who hate me for being, um, you know, a, a, a transphobe and another group of people who hate me for being a kind of woke careerist. And you're like, okay, but I can't, I can't judge this. You, 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 I think all of you should get together and fight it out, given that you've got completely divergent things that you hate me for and come up to some sort of synthesis of resolution of this. But yeah, it's a, it's a fundamentally dehumanizing experience. But I also think that you also cast people as the thing that you find easiest to argue against. Um, so the Atlantic has a number of great rules that they tell you when you join, one of which is something like, don't be a dick. I mean, it's, I think they phrase it slightly more than that, but it's like, you don't care how good your copy is, you still got to be pleasant to your co-workers, which again is something that I think more people could benefit from being told. But the other one is you have to argue with the best version of your opponent's argument. Because what you're talking then about is a, is a, a thing called nut picking, like cherry picking, but for, for the nuts. And it's really easy to do that and really lazy to do that in internet arguments. Go and find someone saying something stupid and argue with them. And I have that experience sometimes when I write a piece and people don't argue with the, I mean, this is very basic stuff, but people don't argue with the piece that you've actually written. They argue that the piece that they've been waiting for someone to write so that they can have a go at that piece and make themselves look good. So I wrote a piece about Elon Musk uh, a couple of weeks ago, in which I said, you know, a number of things about how I think he's a very running Twitter in a very chaotic way and I can see why no one would want to live there but I was trying to explain his appeal and why if you look at any of his mad dragon tweets they've all got a hundred thousand likes on them I was going like he is playing the heel he like you know he likes being the the villain and his whole shtick is do you want to have Mark Zuckerberg pretending to care about healing the world or Sam Bankman Freed, you know, saying I've got to earn all this money because I need to give it away. Or do you just want to have me going, I'm rich, I'm Elon Musk, I do what I want, like Cartman from South Park. And actually, a lot of people find that much more honest. They assume that all rich people are awful and at least you're telling the truth about it. And people did not like that. They were like, do you like the taste of licking Elon's boot, you know, lackey? And I was like, I think this piece is really critical of him but I'm just saying that people do like him and that is an observable fact in the world but they wanted to argue with the pro Elon piece right so they just decided that that's the piece that I'd written and it's the great tragedy of social media is that you become what people need you to be to make them to to be themselves what they want to present to the world we saw this the most easy example that I saw of what you're describing and also the PK rule was just before Sam Harris left Twitter Every single tweet that he put up was replied to by hundreds of people with the same quote of, I wouldn't care if Hunter Biden had dead children in his basement, that laptop story still shouldn't have been like stopped or whatever it was that, that he said. And I'm like, well, like I get it, but he wasn't tweeting about that. And bringing that up kind of just seems a little bit pointless. But for some people, like that's the most recent great transgression that he did. So therefore, that's how we're going to categorize that. Um you also looked at someone that drank their own urine. Why? 
did you look at them and why were they drinking? Oh right, and why urine? do they drink their own urine? Yeah, there was a, a there was a, a conversation where I went, you know, I love the BBC, but I do not love the BBC enough to drink my own urine. I'm just going to put that out there now. Don't ask me. I will not do. I will do anything for love, but I will not do that. Um, is your own sweet Canadian guy who was a contestant on Canadian Idol called um, Will Blunderfield? Lovely. Just got off the phone with him, and I just thought, what a sweet young man. But drinks his own piss, and not just his own piss, as it turns out. He's, there's a whole video where he's like, and it's got a little bit of pre-cum in it. And we had a long discussion about whether or not it was just simply too unpleasant <laughs> a phrase to be airing on Radio 4 when people might be having the, you know, their breakfast. Um, we decided we were going to keep it in uh, anyway, because, you know, that's that's real life. But um, yeah, there's, that is, drinking your own urine is one of these strangely recurrent practices. So it's still used in traditional medicine in sub-Saharan Africa and places like that. But it has been something that hippies have kind of done frequently. And I just do not understand it. Like, I, if there is any signal that your body is giving to you in regards to urine, it's like, I want this out of me. This is this is like, this is leaving the body now, not like it needs to come back in. But it's something you find quite a lot. And, you know, for him, it's part of it. She calls it Shivambu and it's part of his kind of wellness practice. But the interesting thing about talking to him was he had had an eye condition, strabismus, where one of his eyes didn't quite track properly and had spent most of his childhood being medicalized. And then he came out as gay and was essentially gay bashed when he was holding his first boyfriend's hand and went to a psychiatrist or a therapist to talk about it. And instead of being given talking therapy, really was put on pills, was said, you know, do you want some antidepressant pills? And I understood from those two experiences why someone would get to the place where they are very skeptical of mainstream traditional medicine, why they don't want to be within what he calls the allopathic system. And so he's become more and more invested in anti-vax stuff. He's one of the people, those people who believe that if you don't eat certain things, then you don't need to wear sunscreen, um, which, you know, he lives in Vancouver where it's pretty chilly most of the time. So we may get away with it. But I think if you live in Australia, probably life threatening kind of level of advice. But I wanted to try and do more than the standard anti-vax thing of saying, well, these people are just wrong and kind of understand psychologically where someone, how someone would get to those opinions. Hmm. Do you know seems... what I mean? Because if you want to argue with anti-vax people or try and convince anti-vax people, then there are a couple of things you need to do. And one of them is be open to the question of whether or not there are occasional vaccine injuries, which there are, right? They're just incredibly rare and much, much rarer than, you know, and, and it's much, much more dangerous to get the illness that you're vaccinating against. So on just a rational risk calculation basis, you just go, I would rather take my chances with the measles vaccine than take my chances with measles. And that's that's where I come from and all of that. But and I think that's probably a you know, I said that to him essentially, and I think that's an easier thing to say to people than a kind of no, no, we all believe in vaccines, a kind of mystical, reverential feeling, which I do have about vaccines. I think vaccines are one of the best things that humanity has ever done, but I can't expect everybody to share that feeling. Whereas I can make a pragmatic argument based on the on the studies and what they show. When it comes to health and fitness, it seems like there are a lot of degrees of freedom, despite the fact that everybody cares about having good health and eating the right things. I had a dietitian on not long ago, a guy called Max Lugavere, and asked him, why is it that we understand the speed of light and yet no one can agree on whether eating carbs is better or worse for you than other different types of macronutrients? And he's like, well, it's because there are so many degrees of freedom within exercise science and nutrition science that you can fit the studies to show basically whatever it is that you want. You can get them to to become whatever it is that you want to do. And I think that this rolls all the way through everything to do with health and fitness. Everybody wants to be healthy. Everybody wants to be in good condition. Everybody wants to live a long life. Sometimes you end up drinking your own piss. Well, I mean, I'm not judging you, Chris, but I, it's not for me is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I know what you mean. And there is an established problem. It's actually one of the things that my friend Carolyn Criado Perez wrote about in her book, Invisible Women, that one of the things that these studies will, won't do often, they will often exclude women from them. If you're looking at any kind of medical study, because they'll just say women's hormonal cycles are too crazy. They're just injecting all this stuff into the data. We don't want to do it. So you will find quite big drug studies that are only tested on on men because just adding in female hormones is, is just considered to be like too wacky never mind the idea that people have different hormonal profiles as they go through age for example and like what might be an appropriate dose for a 20 something man and a 70 year old man might be very different we just don't know about that internal body chemistry but yeah i know what you mean you have to, there has to be a certain level of humility about things that are related to health because health advice does change and is fluid and is always this is the best that we know right now not the kind of final finished tablet of stone being handed down well when you think about something which is even more 
arbitrary in terms of your uh, life well-being, I suppose. Productivity, like I say, a world that I used to come from, one that I spent a lot of time in. Very good friends with Ali Abdal, who you spent a good bit of time speaking to on the show. And yet, that is, I would guess, probably the largest personal development subsection on YouTube and also probably in nonfiction too. It'll be that and spirituality, I would guess, would probably be the two when it comes to books. Uh, and people are obsessive about that. People need a guru behind that because if I can fit more into my life, then it's kind of the same as me extending the amount of time that I'm alive. It's a denial of death. Yeah, I really like the productivity gurus. They were my, um, they were the most wholesome bunch, shall we say. Like I liked lots of people, but they were the ones I felt least you know, at least guilty about liking because they are just genuinely mostly very hardworking people who want to try and help other people achieve their goals. But even then, like you say, I did feel there was a certain downside to it, which is that lots of people feel that they're lacking something, you know, that they're always, I think Oliver Berkman put it about the idea that people feel like they wake up in the morning with a debt, you know, they're already behind and they spend the whole day kind of catching up and they never just think that what they've got is enough. They always feel that they're failing. And that was definitely something that spoke to me. I'm a terrible workaholic I actually I went to a therapist about four years ago and my main thing that I wanted to talk about was like how can I say no please teach me how to say no to work um because I will always feel like oh they'll never ask me again or oh I should feel so flattered to be asked or you know what if this opportunity doesn't come up again and you have to you know then you get the kind of classic Warren Buffett advice which is most people who are very successful say no to most things and you think Warren Buffett how do you do it tell me maybe I need to get Warren Buffett round to turn down you know minor appearances on the BBC for me like I just can't do it I, I don't have the self-control or the stamina for it I think um, Oliver's approach in 4,000 weeks is the best one that I found it's like look you're not going to be able to do all of this stuff prepare in advance what you're going to suck at pick a small domain of things that you want to be good at and then just leave the rest. So if, if the productivity people were the ones that you enjoyed loving the most, who were the ones that you hated loving the most? Was there someone that you found an affinity for and you felt guilty about it? Well, I say, say, I felt, I felt very bad about the fact that I fundamentally disagree with Will on, you know, the merits of drinking your own piss, but I nonetheless got on with him. And I didn't, you know, it's, it's a difficult line to walk when you're presenting someone with extreme views like that. I went and looked up the scientific literature on drinking your own urine. This kind of amused me. There's not really that much, except that when it's used in traditional medicine, there is a worry that you will pass on drug-resistant bacteria from one person's urine to another. And he went very sweetly, oh, I wouldn't drink someone else's. Like, oh, no, that's, that's the act of a madman, um, which was really funny because it just proves that everybody's got their own line for what they consider to be kooky. And some people's line is further out there than mine, but it's, you know, it's still there. So I did like them. Um, I found the pickup artists really difficult to deal with because having written about feminism for so long, I have, you know, I know what those communities can be like um, and how deliberately cruel they can be to people that they feel are against them. I think one of the kind of most dangerous things in life is feeling that you can be ho horrible to other people because you've got a grievance and that justifies it, if you see what I mean. So, what you know, the I'm grievance very of the manosphere be? Oh, that, that women have completely taken over, you know, that actually it's much harder to be a man now, um, that women are withholding sex from men, that they hold all the cards in relationships, that they routinely make false rape accusations, you know, those kind of things that you see over and over. And my experience of, you know, having lightly encountered those communities before is that they will just pick over the fact that they'll say, you know, well, of course, you know, like all the things they say about me, like, you know, I'm, I haven't got any kids, so obviously I'm going to die alone um, or, you know, just that you're really ugly or whatever it is. And probably when I was younger, that kind of bothered me more. I think maybe now I just don't care anymore. But, there, you know, that they were a community that seemed to absolutely delight in trashing anybody who crossed them. And I could see where it came from. I could see that it came from this feeling it was about leveling the playing field, about settling a score, making redress. But I think that's always such an incredibly dangerous thing to kind of tell yourself, give yourself moral license that, you know, I'm allowed to do this because I'm in the right. I don't have to obey the normal rules because I, my cause is justified. That rarely leads to good places, in my view. Mm. Yeah, I got a... Sometimes there'll be comments on the channel talking about um, how this person or this researcher or this analyst doesn't agree with the existing sacred cows that the red pill or the manosphere or the whatever community agrees with. And... Every single time that I see that, it seems to me to be a pretty good sign. Because I'm like, the further that I 
continue to reinforce the fact that this is not a channel for people that want Manosphere content. This is not a channel for people that want red pill content. This is not a channel for people that want to create them and us tribal adversarial relationships between men and women. Every single person that I speak to sees the fundamental relationship between men and women as one that is collaborative, not competitive. And that is so hard to find on the internet. Like even, even when it comes from, uh, like L and cosmopolitan, uh, how to sleep with him and not catch feels, you know, how to get over, how to get your boyfriend like back by sleeping with his best friend. Like these are articles, non-ironic articles that go out in commercial magazines, right? This isn't some fucking r slash female dating strategy, pink pill depths of the internet stuff. This is buy it on a magazine shelf stuff. Like that's really, really terrible. Like if you want to point a finger at toxic femininity, which sometimes is like, what? Where's where's the toxic femininity? It's like it's right fucking there. Like that's one of the instances. I mean, I think most toxic femininity is actually directed. If you want to concede that that's a, a concept, I mean, I I would, I'm pretty reluctant ever to say toxic masculinity or toxic femininity because I think a lot of people just instantly switch off at that point. Correct. But I think if there is such a thing as toxic femininity, it's probably women directing it at other women, um, largely. But I know what you mean. Like having written a book about feminism, I thought a lot about how to make it a message that a, a book even a man could enjoy but you know what i mean like I, and i had a, a a male friend of mine read the draft and i talked it through with him and he kind of said in a couple of places you know but like, yeah, yeah have you not thought about it from our point of view and you know there was a time in internet feminism where that would have been something that people would have scoffed at you know there was a kind of do you remember the sort of drinking male tears era of internet feminism no these very ostentatiously like someone got a hashtag trending once it was like kill all white men or something like that and then Fantastic. they had to explain that right but then there was this whole people went that's very offensive and they went no 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 it's actually obviously it would be offensive to the other way around but it's okay because it's a, a punchy satire on power relations and you're like oh god are you all of you 12 don't do that but you know I, and i did have a and the conclusion that i came eventually came to in difficult women is that you have to have a kind of policy-based idea of feminism right here are the things that we want and like you could agree with me or not so if i say to you look you know i think it's mad that the u.s doesn't have any federally mandated maternity leave women have to cobble together bits of their holiday and unpaid time off i'm not requiring you to agree with me that women are in some way better than men or like everyone has to have their unique gender roles whatever it is it's just a thing that you can agree with or not on a policy level and that fundamentally to me is where feminism can go in a way that builds coalitions rather than being about some of those dry arguments about who's more of a twat than the other gender right yes well i mean the that goes back to what i said before about men and women fundamentally being collaborative rather than competitive because intrasexual competition is way 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 bigger than intersexual competition right women compete with women mostly and men compete with men mostly ancestrally that seems to be the case and it looks the same way now on average, it's. Have you seen the stats around? Uh, most pro-life votes come from women rather than men. Yeah, I don't think that there's a massive percentage difference, but it makes sense to me that there are women who are very invested in the idea of themselves as mothers and um, and having a maternal caring role and taking care of babies, and and therefore they see abortion through that prism. They don't see it through the prism of personal independence and freedom and bodily autonomy. So yeah, I know what you mean. It's really interesting when you do those kind of slice and dice. Like you just you get it a lot in. Um, arguments over things like sex work oh we'll just listen to listen to women listen to sex work listen to whatever the group is and actually in the case of people who are working currently in the sex industry they're going to by definition have one set of views on it right you're not going to find a lot of radical feminist abolitionists working in the sex industry for very good reasons and so those appeals to identity can often be incredibly um reductive really as if we don't live in a society and only one group of people get to have opinions on the things that they do you know we should only ask billionaires about what tax rates billionaires would pay oh yeah okay that seems like a really good idea i can imagine probably what that answer is going to be thanks what did you learn from the crypto gurus the crypto bros um so one of the ones i interviewed i don't know if you know him is peter mccormack who bought real bedford fc Really interesting, fun guy. Great to get along with. He grew up in Bedford, um, which for American listeners is like, what's a, what's a kind of very boring American town? I'm not sure. Not sure there is a anywhere in yeah. like anywhere in like 
Indianapolis Westchester? or Wisconsin. What about Westchester? Fine, like it's we'll outside London, but it's not super um, fun. But it's a really lovely place to live. But anyway, he um, he made all this money through crypto and his podcast, and then he bought Real Bedford FC, um, and he now has a like a non little non league team that is sponsored by some of these crypto exchanges and gets fans from around the world. And you know. I, it's a really quite a, a sweet and heartwarming story that he wanted to take his internet gains and put them back into an area that he felt needed more opportunities for young people. So I really liked him on that. The funny thing about Peter is that he thinks that almost all crypto is bullshit and full of scam artists. He only believes in Bitcoin. And I said to him, this is really funny. This is, Cut my right, he's a Bitcoin, maxi. He's a Bitcoin maxi. Yeah. And I said, this is really funny to me because this is like how I feel as an atheist talking to people who believe in God. You know, this the famous Ricky Gervais quote about that you think 99% of gods are bullshit. I just think one more is bullshit. And that's how, you know, I, I feel a bit about crypto. I, I haven't ever seen the proposition beyond the fact that technology is really interesting. Um, I haven't really seen how you can create as you know the value of the asset beyond more people buying into a limited resource and so he was a really fun and challenging conversation because he was like you're going to come back in 10 years time and you're going to admit that i'm right because places in the developing world that don't have access to mainstream financial mechanisms you know, by decentralized finance they can skip that whole generation and so yeah we have to meet up again in 10 years time and find out if my skepticism was was validated or not one of the good litmus tests around crypto has been what happens in a bear market and what happens in a bull market. If it was that everybody just cared about being able to give families in war-torn countries the opportunity to send money across the border without government interference, you should be still singing the praises of the technology when the price is 15000 the same as it was when it was 60000 Why aren't you? Why aren't everybody on the internet singing about how brilliant their new crypto toad pixel nft is well it's because it's not worth as much like almost everybody that's into crypto you like it because you're you're able to make free money overnight that's why you like it that, that's fine that's absolutely fine but don't try and tell me that it's because you love the opportunity to repatriate people in developing worlds from the tyranny of some government that wants to take the it's it's got nothing to do with that it's got nothing to do with that or else you would still be just as passionate when the market was shit as when the market was good and the market is currently shit and no one's talking about it except being critical uh, yeah but it, again i think it's a place where mainstream journalism came off a lot better than the individuals right because that's a classic example of the fact you had people with a direct financial interest in the sector being the ones who said don't listen to the fud you know you just got to hodl and like that's because their money directly depends on people doing those those things, holding on for dear life and suppressing their fear, uncertainty and doubt. You know, uh, and whereas if you work on the Financial Times, you are much freer to go, hmm, I've taken a look at this crypto exchange and, uh, you know, what's the great thing from the um, the FTX thing where he had a, a, a tab on the spreadsheet that said poorly hidden fiat account and it had eight billion, like the eight billion dollar black hole was was concealed within it, right? That's the kind of thing that you need you know, people on the outside who have no direct financial interest to, to kind of go, ah, I'm just going to stop you there. That that looks bad. That feels bad to me. Bad. What 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 was guru-y about the, the stuff that you looked at to do with crypto? It seems like you just spoke to a guy that bought a, a football team. I don't know. Is he proselytizing? Is he, try, is he part of a pyramid scheme? Is What's he trying to do? Or, or were there other people to do with crypto that were trying to sell it? Yeah, so Peter, Peter is a, uh, he's an interesting one because he's a kind of sort of almost like a self-hating guru and that he says, you know, come for the gain, stay for the revolution. Like he he's invested in people getting into crypto because he believes in the power of the technology. Um, but that's not where everybody is. You know, we spoke to uh, Leia Heilpern, who's another British crypto guru. She's very big. She got, she's a very big libertarian. She, actually, you'll like this. She now lives most of the time in Miami because she thinks that British men are weak and effeminate. She and I said, is the girl who keeps defending Andrew Tate on Fox News. Yes. Yeah. So, and I said, hang on a minute, men in Miami, like Miami home of the famous, like incredibly camp muscle beach of men in tiny shorts who like the company of other men. These are your like, you know, this is what the paradigm of masculinity is to you. And yeah, well, I don't think we really got very much further than that. But it was just very funny to me because I think London is full of big hench lads. Um, and I don't know what... That's your what, what area of does. expertise, not mine, Helen. <laughs> she's just not going to the right places, basically, is what I think. And what did you learn yeah. from her? 
Well, she was really interesting because um, she's Jewish. And, and I did say to her, like, would you have Kanye on the podcast? And now he's in his full anti-Semitic pomp. And she's like, yeah, I would. And I was like, what about an actual neo-Nazi? And she's like, yeah, I would. And that to me is a kind of just a completely different fundamental approach to free speech than I have, which, you know, there's sort of much more libertarian ideas. And that carries through into a lot of that crypto space is very libertarian. They absolutely don't believe in government intervention. They don't, you know, they're very hostile to the whole idea of of government. And it's really interesting talking to people like that because I'm a kind of normie social democrat. You know, I think it's I quite like the idea that when I phone the fire brigade, the fire brigade turn up. Like that's fine by me. Um, and so it's always really challenging. It's one of the things I really appreciate about doing this job is talking to people who have ended up in very different political positions to me, who are clearly smart and like working out what it is that got them there and got me here. What about that struggle session, public humiliation bondage thing where white women were made to be <laughs> shouted at around a table, but they couldn't cry? I don't think there's any actual bondage, but I think you may have just added that in in your own artistic personal license, view. whatever. Yeah, of what's it's going not out on. yet. The series yeah. isn't out yet. I can imagine what I want. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, um, so Race to Dinner was founded by two women, uh, an Indian American woman called Syra Rao and a Black American woman called Regina Jackson, and they for five thousand um, dollars a dinner will get a woman to invite all her white women friends, and then they will ask them who's racist, and put up their hands if they're racist. Um, what if you don't put this- your hand up. Well, no, then you get shouted at because you should have put your hand up because everyone's racist. It's a Kafka trap. It's Kafka dinner. Yeah, um, but but Cyril will put up her hands because she says, you know, as a as a person of color who's not black, she is institutionally anti-black. And the way that the racial hierarchy works in the US is that everybody who isn't black thinks, well, it could be worse, I could be black. That's their, their premise. But the thing that got me about this is just, and I think maybe part of this is being British as well, I just thought I wouldn't pay to someone to tell me that I wouldn't pay five grand for somebody to tell me that I'm racist. I would pay five grand to tell me that I'm amazing, maybe. Is but... there a certificate? Do you get some sort of know. credential at the end of it? I'm wondering why you would pay five thousand dollars to have this. I mean, is the food particularly good? Is the service nice? No, you have to is order there a goodie food. bag. <laughs> No, there is not a no. There is not a goodie bag. Hand job at um, the end of it. I, like, what's going abs- on here? As far as I know, absolutely not. Um, but okay, so here's the thing that I think is there is a deep strain of masochism. I think through a lot of w- women, particularly white liberal middle class women, you know, these are the same group of people who buy women's magazines that tell you that you're fat and disgusting and you need to diet. Um, and the same people who look at the Daily Mail sidebar of shame about, you know, people who've got cankles and turkey necks and all the things that are kind of horribly wrong with you. You know, and I think a lot back to my formative experience. When I was a teenager, I used to read FHM, which kind of dates me because it hasn't ex- existed for like two decades now, because I found the men's magazines of the 90s were like, you're amazing. Like, here's how to go out and score some chicks. Like, here's the, where we went to Vegas in a poker game and like, you know, the guy who lost had to get breast implants. A real story, I remember from FHM. And the women's magazines were like, here are all the ways in which you're failing. Like, here's how to pluck your hair out of various bits of your body so you're not repellent anymore. And I thought, I don't, this is not for me. Like, I want I want fun and adrenaline and racing big cars around. Um, and I think that that tendency, that sort of self-flagellating tendency has carried on. And I did ask them, I was like, you couldn't get eight men to sit down and listen to how they're all racist and pe- and, and then pay you. Like, I just don't believe that that business model works with men. And that, that to me is completely fascinating that there is some kind of mis- sort of, yeah, deep masochistic streak in some kind of white middle liberal class women where they want to be told that they're terrible and sort of luxuriate in it. Did you draw a line between that and Robin D'Angelo's work? Yeah. So they, one of the things I said to them about, you know, what a great business model, five grand to make white women cry. You know, I've been trying to do that with my articles for years, but I've never got paid that much for it. Um, the, they said, well, you should, you know, that's a racist question. You should see how much Robin D'Angelo gets paid. And it's true. She gets paid an enormous amount of money. White privilege. Um, and in and, and White Fragility, there is a chapter called White Women's Tears, which is all about how, you know, the, it is emotionally manipulative when white women are confronted with their racism that they will burst into tears and then everyone will comfort them. Um, and there's this whole slew of books called things like white feminist or um brown skin white tears you know that that are all about this premise that white women are the absolute worst and the audience for that is white women you know that's what i, I just I, it's so one of those times where i just think shades just, of gray without any of the sex 
right. I just I don't understand. I don't fundamentally understand that mindset either. So I was trying to get into that that mindset too and what, about what the kind you, of purification what, rituals. Of yeah. It. What have you come to believe? Like what what's you have written about women for a long time. You have been a woman for a long time, and True. you have now considered this new public flagellation, self humiliation, humiliation thing with a five grand price tag. How does this fit into the broader narrative of what you think it means to be a white middle class woman in the modern world? I think it's even more than that. I mean, I think about there's a brilliant um, piece by all people of by Hilary Mantel in the London Review of Books, which is her review of stay with me on this, her review of books about medieval saints, medieval anorexic saints. And it's called Some Girls Want Out. And it's basically about the fact that all of these women looked at the kind of bargain about what it meant to be a woman in the world. And they went, no, I'm not doing it. I'm going to a nunnery and I'm starving myself and I'm going to have these sort of trances that are caused by hunger and, and see visions of Jesus. I want I want out. And then when I was growing up, lots of girls used to do self-harm. You know, you had, you had cutting scars all down your arms. Um, and then I wrote a piece last year about... Uh, white women primarily in academia who pretended to be women of color like the sort of rachel dolezal kind of feel which was always really interesting was that they were women who worked in like race studies and they decided they identified so strongly with the idea of being minorities that they came to believe that they were minorities themselves in some way and i talked to an expert in munchausen's factitious disorder because i wondered if this was a kind of social version of that what is, what is a, fact, a, a, what's munchausen's i've heard of it but so, i don't know what it is so Munchausen's is when you keep reporting to the doctor with injuries that you have either dreamed up or inflicted on yourself. So class, you know, people sort of drink bleach and then talk about their stomach ulcers or whatever it is. And Munchausen's by proxy is when you often usually take it's a child, you know, you make them ill deliberately because people want that patient role. They want that attention. They want the sympathy. They get a feeling of validation from, from it. Um, and I think that there was a kind of similar thing happening at a social level with those academics that they wanted to be the minority. They wanted to be speak with the authority and truth. And you look through, it happens through every major historical event. You know, there are fake Holocaust survivors. There are fake Bataclan survivors. There are fake 9-11 survivors. Some people are just innately drawn to that idea of, you know, spilling their guts and being a victim in that sense. And, you know, I talked to an expert on Munchausen's and I said, it's really notable to me that, that these are primarily women. And he said, well, I think, you know, often men, when they're kind of, troubled and sociopathic they turn it outwards they go out on the, the big binge drinking spree or they smash something up or they drive the car too fast or whatever it is they get into fights and women turn it inwards and women become anorexic women self-harm i think you can see it related to the way that teenage girls now often are reporting with with gender dysphoria they are turning that pain inwards on them on themselves um and i do think that's probably something that is either through socialization or, or biology, just a, a fundamental difference in the way that kind of those things manifest. And they want to go to these dinners as a another form of that? Yeah, it is. But it is a bit like self-harm, isn't it? It's somebody to tell you that you're awful with the premise that then you you purify yourself at the end, which is something that comes up a lot in discussions of anorexia right that people don't want to eat food because it's sort of dirty and disgusting or they don't want to have an adult body because it's dirty and disgusting so there are i think the same ideas of purity perhaps that persist through all of that mm. what about and i'm Steve? sure men do it too right like i'm sure that there are men who become anorexic I mean, there are men who become anorexic or there are men who who juice because they want to have a, a, a you know they have an idea that their body's disgusting if it's not got like seven percent body fat or whatever it might be yeah i think that that was it, it seems like the liver king says that his uh, sense of self-esteem contributed to him wanting to be in in this sort of condition that he's trained twice a day with these brain busting workouts for many hours seven days a week for however many decades he's been doing it for for precisely that reason um it does seem like a phenomenon that women are more susceptible to than guys i mean self-harm rates i think are higher amongst girls than they are amongst boys yeah suicide attempts are higher among women but successful, successful suicide yeah. attempts men, are higher among men yeah. yeah uh that's so that's i mean that's a that's a really really interesting statistic that i still haven't worked out what to do with that in my mind you know when you know 
your famous conversation with Jordan Peterson, one of the things that he says back, you know, however many percent of suicides are men. Uh, and you go, well, yes. How do we fold into that conversation that women attempt it more? Like, what does it, what does it mean to say, like, how many failed suicide attempts is worth a successful suicide attempt? Like, if you try to kill yourself a hundred times, is that the same as one person that manages to do it once? How much of those can be written off as a cry for help? How much of that is just a, a literal lack of ability to use lethal force? Like, how many women would have done it had they have been able to do it? How many, like, there's so many different filters and layers that you go through here. And I really don't know how to fold that in. I think about it more frequently than I probably realize uh, that you've got those two stats that kind of. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's one of those things that doesn't, no, and you can't draft it into any kind of sex war format because it's not like, I don't think there's anything that we could be doing differently in gender terms that would make the men's rates come down. Like, you know what I mean? There's no way in which I think it's women's fault that men are killing themselves at that rate. Like, it's not, it, the, the reasons for suicide are so difficult and complex and often usually like a whole welter of different factors that it resists being conscripted into any kind of simple narrative. Um, but I agree with you. Like, I, I, I really wish that we had a better idea that we actually knew what the prescription was to lower male suicide rates. Like, I just think that's the bit that no one seems to know. No one seems to know. It's not like one of those situations where, you know, we, we know what the, you know, like I think about prisons policy a lot, right? We send far too many people to prison for minor offenses where, and that's mostly men because most of the people in prison are men. And that means that their lives are completely trashed and they never manage to come back out of that spiral of graduating through bigger and bigger crimes. And then they're institutionalized forever. And the, obvious solution to that is send fewer people to prisons and fewer men to prison for low level offenses, have more community punishments. And we know the reason that people don't do that is because a very strong right wing press will crucify any politician who does that. Anyone who commits a rape while out on remand will that, you know, the politician who was responsible for that will get pilloried in the press. But there's not that, you know, there's not the thing that I know what's the lever to pull and who's stopping it being pulled in the case of male suicide. And that's what makes it really really difficult. It gets thrown at feminists a lot about like, what are you doing about male suicide? And the answer is, well, not very much because no one, no one seems to know what the thing is that we need to be doing. Are you familiar with Cal Soper? Do you know him? He wrote a book called The Evolution of a Life Worth Living. No, I don't. So, whole thing. I've got him coming on the show at the start of next year. So once the episode's up, I'll send it to you. I think he'd be really interested. And he conducted a study in which someone was given the option of dating uh, at two different types of person. One of them had a single previous suicide attempt, and the other one currently, right now, had cancer. On average, people wanted the person that had cancer. That's a really interesting finding. His I entire mean- theory behind it is that um, many, almost all, social reinforcement mechanisms are there to stop people from committing suicide, to stop them from taking their own life. He sees depression as not a precursor to, but a defensive mechanism against uh, suicide. Most people that commit suicide aren't actually depressed. It doesn't seem. It seems that people, when you get depressed, it restricts the amount of movement and and energy that you expend. I haven't got into the book sufficiently deeply, so I, there may be areas of this that I'm butchering because I remember it from a half-cut dinner three weeks ago when I first learned about him. Um, but all of this is fascinating. And my, my point being that it is such a difficult, idiosyncratic, individual problem to try and look at. Like, why is it that any one person arrives at the point where they decide to do that? I don't know. Like The bit that I do think we could probably do more about is about cultivating men's social relationships. Um, like, I do think there is an established thing that men, particularly when they get married, if they're straight, they run all their kind of social life and their social relationships through their wife. You know, the people like them, you must know some of those guys who just have no idea when anyone in their family's birthday is don't, you know, don't arrange to see friends. They just kind of, they get buffeted around. And I, I'm pretty sure there's research that says that means that widowers struggle a lot more actually than widows because they don't have a kind of social um, sort of safety support net by them. Um, and it's one of the things I think, again, like the internet is a kind of bit of a problem with is that they also talk about the fact that women talk to each other and men talk side by side with each other right like you go fishing or you go to the football Mm -hmm. or you go and do something and then the conversation happens in those spaces i think it's harder maybe for men to like phone up their mates and go like 
can we just have a chat? Need a hand here, mate. Yeah. Did you right. read uh, Billy No Mates this year by Max Dickens? I didn't read that, but I heard about it. Yeah, Great. it sounded really interesting. Really worthwhile. Or you could just listen to the podcast I did with him. And okay, that's it. That sorted that problem. Yeah, he he was really great, and he had a bunch of suggestions that I've seen come from women as well as guys. Nina Power and Louise Perry both brought this solution up, and then so did Max. And it was the reintroduction of male only spaces as something which should be encouraged again because there was fifty years ago uh, the working men's clubs and the halls of power that only men were allowed into was seen as a vaulted room in which the important decisions that would fix and uh, choose the destiny for women's lives were being made that needed to be broken open so that men were no longer the ones that were making the decisions on behalf of women and what that's in their opinion ended up with is a removal of a lot of the male only spaces that allowed men to bond in the way that they perhaps used to and max's uh, research seems to show precisely what you said a man gets into a marriage and then transplants his entire friend group with that of his wife. And then now he's just, it's like his wife's friends that are now his friends. But if they ever split up and ever increasing divorce rates mean that they might, he's now left with no wife and no friends because all of the friends were her friends. They were friends with him because of her, but they're not friends with him. Yeah, I think that's true. That, I, that's interesting about Melanie spaces. I agree with you. The problem is that you know, when I think about that, I think about things like, you know, whether it's the judges all going to the Garrett Club or Whites or the private members club or or equally well, the thing that happened, you know, within my lifetime, which is that the group of lawyers all go to the strip club after work. Um, and those become ways in which men advance through the company um, and, and women are locked out. People with caring responsibilities can't kind of go and do those things. But there is a I mean, my dad was a member of a working men's club which he used to take me to put me in the saloon bar, give me two pounds to put in the quiz machine and tell me to like come, you know, just earn it, keep earning it back to keep entertaining myself um, while he was in the bar bar bit. Um, and I think that was, you know, that was something that he got a great deal out of. And I think that was a fairly wholesome space. I very much doubt those people were being wildly misogynist in there or they were kind of scratching each other's backs in a kind of um, nepotistic work way. So I don't think I'd be against that. I mean, it would be very interesting to know whether or not there'd be a huge backlash to that. I mean, there's a huge backlash to the idea of women only spaces. Um, so I don't, I don't know well, whether like, or not men only spaces would be seen as well to the idea that women kind of are gathering together is seen as sort of innately kind of, um, transgressive now. And actually I, 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 my, my opinions on this have slightly changed to the extent that I think probably, I think there should only be women only spaces now really for safety. Like I'm not sure I would want to join a women only club is that not just because you don't want to be around that many women you're they're not going to have as interesting co like what do you what's what's your issue with Rude. lots of women come on i, I went to an all-girls school so you know that, that doesn't put you off women for life no i did but i did genuinely get to university and i was like i'm gonna be friends with men now and i lived with male housemates and i've always had loads of male friends ever since um but no i might but I say most of my close friends are women. i'm not sure if that's actually true but like probably 50 50 but i i just think actually that it, it obviously upsets men horribly to be excluded from women's spaces. And so you should have really clear provisions about why those spaces exist. And also that we're kind of, you know, in lots of ways, much more than we were in the past, much more equal. Why do you still need single sex spaces? But maybe, I don't know. I, the one thing I do, I, I interviewed Louise for The Spark. And the thing I really disagreed with her on was this idea that women shouldn't get drunk in mixed sex spaces. I was like, I can't believe you're advocating the existence of Saudi Arabia. Like I'm listening to this. This is really your, your solution. And she said, look, it's not like that at all. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's norm, you know, normy advice. And I can see that that's true. Actually, there are lots of situations in which I wouldn't go out and get completely drunk because I think it would be irresponsible, but it, it's something about it just still really, really rankles with me. The idea that we're going to have to accept that forever that men are so dangerous. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm still slightly utopian. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, David Buss's Men Behaving Badly kind of showed me I, I don't make a uh, habit of hanging around with sexual aggressors and sexual offenders. So learning from David that it's a small minority of men committing the vast majority of offenses repeatedly, that opened my, just learning that fact opened my eyes to like, oh, just because I don't know any people that act like that doesn't mean that there can't be tons and tons of crimes like that. You, you don't need like one man to one crime. You can have one man to a hundred crimes, right? Um, 
I that's a difficult one. I didn't speak to Louise about that with the mixed sex drinking spaces. Coming from her background, that uh, women that have been killed during rough sex uh, court thing, I can't remember what it's called, that she worked for. Um, the rough sex defense, yeah, and we can't consent to this. Yeah, and I think that's true. I, that's the stuff that like I do primed, agree with her on. Right, the like, for like super this. sex positivity stuff has been... Uh, you know, I was writing in Difficult Women about the idea that the sexual liberation of the 60s was basically like, you have to be up for it all the time. And that, you know, now you can't say no, because that means you're frigid. And there is a certain thing that now happens with things like freedom. choking, I think, too. That sounds like freedom. Yeah, where it's like, <laughs> if you don't want to get choked, that's because you're some uptight bitch. And it's like, it's really very dangerous thing to do. And as you say, there are a very small number of men who will choke a woman to death and then claim that that was totally consensual. And some of those cases are horrific. Some of those cases, people have got multiple other injuries. You've had things shoved inside them and you just think there probably has to be limits on what we assume people can consent to, which is very paternalistic. I agree. Like again, coming from the sort of body modification sites of the 2000s, you know, there was a famous case of the bottom branding couple and all this sort of stuff about whether or not you could consent to S&M. And we've moved incredibly far on that actually in the, in the British law in the last couple of decades. But I wonder if people are now, some creeping unease is coming in about that, maybe. What about Steve Jobs? What did you learn about him? What about, what about Steve Jobs? I think from consensual S&M to Steve Jobs. It's a natural it's a progression as far as I can see. Well, I was interested in him anyway, because I've been writing this book about genius, which has a lot of overlaps um, with gurus, in that who gets acclaimed as a genius and who actually changes the world are often not necessarily, you know, it's, it's a Venn diagram rather than a circle. And Steve Jobs was an incredibly good marketer. Like he is of a type with people like Thomas Edison or Elon Musk in that he created an aspiration and a lifestyle and products that went with it. And that is a type of genius, totally. But it is also that he was a showman. And I think that's incredible. But the thing that kind of came up from us is that he was also deeply interested in Indian spirituality. So at his funeral, he gave everybody a copy of Autobiography of a Yogi by Yogananda. And he went to India in the 70s and tried to find a guru of his own and was into primal scream therapy and mucusless diets. And we didn't get to put it in the show, but Dan Kotke, who was like employee number one for Apple, told us that at one point Steve went to the local Zen monastery with like a copy of the second generation Mac and was like, look, this is for you. And this Zen monk was like, I don't believe in possessions. What do you, what do you want from me here? And he just uh, he just couldn't quite contemplate that anybody wouldn't want one of his like shiny new computers. Um, but you can definitely see that in the whole aesthetic of Apple, the kind of clean lines of of, of it. Um, Is and, Jobs a know, guru? And, Did you see him as a guru as well? Well, we had this conversation with several people who knew him, and, and one of them said, look, he'd said, if I ever turn into a guru, kill me. But he kind of did, didn't he? Like, he did kind of preach a certain aesthetic and a lifestyle and have a kind of, people would refer to the cult of Apple, you know, that they thought they were more than computers. They were a representative of kind of, you were this very cool San Francisco Bay hip young tech guy rather than a square Windows user. So he did in some respects make himself a guru. That doesn't mean that he was a bad guru or that he didn't achieve a lot. Um, but yeah, I think he was a guru. When it comes to people who've had influence and changed the world and the intersection of those, what's your thoughts on Jordan Peterson? Do you think that he has influenced the world? Do you think that he's just had influence? What's your opinion on that? Well, I've heard from a lot of Jordan Peterson fans having interviewed him. Um, and there are lots of particularly young men who really credit him for having given them a narrative about their lives that, you know, they could improve, like of self-improvement, right? That you do just, you tidy the bedroom, you put the, you know, you have the shower. And the kind of thing I find really sad about that is the fact that there were some people for whom this was really useful advice. And you're thinking, what has happened in your life that, you know, have a shower every morning and try and have some self-respect is something that you needed to hear from, you know, not from your friends or family, but from someone outside that. But equally well, I'm really pleased that they got that. So my interactions, yeah, I had some very unpleasant. There are still people who are now you know, vandalizing my Wikipedia page to this day because they're so angry about that interview. But there were also some people who who really did take guidance from him. The thing I do think about him is that he was incredibly unsuited for internet fame, uh, psychologically. And it's sort of sadly ironic that he, as a psychologist, kind of couldn't see that because he got that thing where half the people were telling him he was the Messiah and he'd saved them and they're coming up to him. And half the people were kind of like you said earlier, treating him like the devil. And he just wasn't able to tune out 
that noise and be himself and find himself somewhere in that bubble. And I think it really, really, really got to him. Um, Would he not say that it was more the stress of wife being ill downstream from that, like a lot of personal things? I mean, layering on top of that, the pressure of the of the public world, but he, as far as I'm aware, doesn't usually attribute it much to what's going on publicly. It was almost all what was going on privately. Do you not think that that's right? Well, he did say that recently that being in Twitter was like people sort of shouting at you 24-7, which is, you know, Sam pretty Harris, good experience of, Sam of Twitter. called it uh, the most malignant form of telepathy where all that you ever hear are the shittest of everybody else's thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably, uh, is that the same one when he later had this phrase that I absolutely loved in his podcast, which was, we're frolicking in the ruins of our, was it, we're frolicking in the ruins of our shared epistemology. Maybe. (laughs) That's Which is like one of these things you're like, wow, okay, I will never say those words in that order on a a podcast. Well done, Sam. But yeah, I'm not, I know that's what he says, but he has come up with several different versions of the cider vinegar story. Um, and the, you know, and the strange beef based diet story, but yeah, I don't, no one goes through their partner being diagnosed with a potentially life threatening cancer. Um, and you know, through his dependence on benzodiazepines, you know, those are things that I think would would challenge even the kind of strongest. David Goggins and Jocko Willink would have an issue getting through that, let alone somebody who'd already been pretty stressed it suffered from clinical depression all of his life as as far as he knew so yeah i have great personal sympathy with him but i also think it's sort of ironic that somebody who was a great guru of personal responsibility doesn't seem to be able to stop tweeting just tweeting constantly day and night now he's back on twitter and it's clearly not good for him um because he's just getting angry with random anonymous people online and you know i do sort of i I absolutely understand. I have had my moments of arguing with random people online and I know what it's like when you, I think people use it as a form of self-harm to some extent, social media like that. You know that people are going to come back and say horrible things to you and you sort of do it anyway, knowing that. Like, I do think that is a kind of strange adult version of slicing up your arms with a razor blade. Um, and it's, it's a real shame that he can't stop himself really because there are like, you know, I talked to David Fuller for this, um, for one of the episodes. And he really loved, you know, the Jungian perspectives. He really loved his attempt to synthesize all these interesting traditions of psychoanalysis and all the stuff he would write about story structure and stuff like that. There was obviously a lot of intellectual content that was not culture war related in Jordan Peterson. And I, you know, I'm not a personally a massive fan, but that I, to me, that was the best of him. And he's not doing that anymore. Is he? He's doing He's, 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 or at least his attention seems to be on the worst bits of his personality, the, the bits that I like the least, I guess. Well, I, I would certainly say I would be a good avatar for one of those people, not necessarily the clean up your room. I think I'd thankfully managed to Your room looks delightful, that. I have thankfully. to say. Yeah, so yeah, it, the, yeah, yeah. the advice has worked. Thank you. Um, however, there was a, a good bit of stuff. I was the prototypical 28-year-old guy man-childing his way through a world that, gave him success that society said he should enjoy and yet hadn't found the fulfillment that he thought that he should do. And, you know, tell the truth. That was the first time that anybody had said that that was something that I really, really should focus on. Not like as an arbitrary, it's the honest and good thing to do, but like this is actually something that you can aim for. And I'm like, wow, like that's really, that's very, very interesting. And then you see Sam writes the book Lying, which is basically kind of the same thing, but from a more philosophical kind of pragmatic side and then extreme ownership uh, comes out from jocko willink and you go okay like everybody's converging on the same thing but jordan was the whatever the gateway drug for me with that but i also know what you mean when it comes to someone using like overusing twitter and getting into a rhythm of being adversarial on there any time that i ever end up getting tagged in a thread with chris kavanagh i know that checking twitter for the next 24 hours is pointless because my notifications, no matter even if I have a tweet that goes super viral, they're going to be dominated by his argument with this person who has an egg for a profile. Like that's, he will not let it go. If there's an argument that to be had, like Chris's Irish heritage will win out and he will continue <laughs> to like, they're a war, they're a, a resilient bunch. And um, yeah. Yeah, I personally, I, I don't understand it. I mean, I, I, I like Chris an awful lot. I think he's a, a great guy, but I don't have, I do not share his desire to correct people who are wrong on the internet. In fact, you may be even to see up there, I have the XKCD cartoon, which is like, you know, the one which is the famous one of come to bed. I can't, someone is wrong on the internet. 
that was to me a, a time in my life that I'm very happy to have to have left behind, I guess. Um, it's habituated so. though, right? You know, you, you get yourself in the rhythm. You'll have done this. You have these sort of micro habit routines where I know for a, a period of time, there's a particular book or whatever that you're obsessed with or, or, or you start a new pursuit or you there's a TV series or something. And for a three month period at 5 p.m. every night, you'll be late making tea or late doing something because you start doing something else, playing pickleball or fucking knitting or whatever it is that you end up doing. And I think that, you know, the feedback mechanism and the dopamine hijack that you get from Twitter means that if that's what you've got yourself locked in on, it can really, really be compelling. And if there is always a, a, a battle to be had, uh, it, it, it's a it's a big temptation. So, yeah, I mean, it'll be it's interesting. It's sugar, though, isn't it? Don't you think about it exactly the same way that you think about bad food, which is that it is initially delicious and it feels so good when you're eating. You know, when you're eating the McDonald's, you're like, oh. Big Mac. Why don't I only eat Big Macs? This is amazing. And then you notice that you're immediately hungry again, and then you feel profoundly sad about your life choices. And you know, and so I, you know, I do eat junk food. I eat junk food occasionally, but I, I know that I wouldn't want to eat a junk food only diet because I would feel, you know, not even uh, any moral qualms. I would just feel worse in myself. I would feel unnourished. Mm. And so much of my project in journalism over the last ten years has been about trying to find to do the things that are genuinely, you know. Not porridge exactly, but like a nice, a, like a nice pokey bowl, like a nice, you know, healthy, balanced diet. And 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 part of that is, I think, podcasts are really good for that because podcasts you do end up having a conversation. You know, I'm sure some of your opinions on topics like gender are in a slightly different place to mine, but we're just going to end up having. I'm going to listen to everything that you say and take it as part of you as a human, and then I'm going to kind of offer my kind of bits that I do and don't agree with, rather than it turning into some kind of sort of Christian and the Lions dunking blood sport where all my feminist fans come out and turn up and tell you that you're a huge misogynist and all your bro fans come up and tell me that I'm a kind of unfuckable harpy and we both have to kind of go back off back off people back off um well, so we can actually have this conversation right like that's well cultivating that's just how a, it goes. cultivating a reasonable audience is, is is an incredibly difficult thing to do on the internet it's like it's it's one of the hardest things to do um and like I don't even know what the term would be, disciplining the audience or guiding them towards... It is like, it does feel like discipline. <laughs> I know what you mean. Like, it is like animal training, and, look, but like in I a want, very, really I, nice way. This is way. the sort of community that I want to have. I want it to be respectful. I want it to be um, thoughtful. I want it to be nuanced. I want it to be insightful. I want it to be patient. I want it to be like all of these things. And yet the stuff that compels people to comment are none of those insights. And then every so often, there'll be this really amazing comment that'll come up on the YouTube and I'll be like heart it and like get it as high because there's certain things you can do to sort of push it push it further up and I'm like look this 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 is the shrine of the type of discussion that I want to have it's polite it's disciplined it's blah blah blah, blah. it's all of those things and yet the internet is you know publicly open to anybody that has the biggest grievance and the most number of capital letters available on their keyboard so yeah I I think it's very, very interesting. Thinking about the, the secular gurus thing, I think it's very timely for you to release this at the moment, especially off the back of um, very bad wizards, conspirituality, uh, decoding the gurus. You know, those are, for better or worse, the, like, insider baseball, like, the the rock stars' favorite bands. I think it's a guilty pleasure. Like, some of those, most podcasters that I know listen to one of those shows in one form or another, because they kind of keep their finger on the pulse of what's happening. And what's the other one? QAnon Anonymous and like other stuff like that. Everybody's got like some finger in one of those pies. I think that the discussion about secular gurus is an interesting one. And I think that it's probably pretty timely to to start talking about it. So I'm looking forward to it coming out. Uh, where should people go if they want to check out this series? And can people outside of the UK yes. listen yes, to it? Yes, you can. So it's a BBC um, Radio 4 and BBC Sounds uh, project. So it comes out in two drops, one on the 19th of December, the first four episodes, and then the next four after that. But it is also available wherever you find your podcasts. Awesome. And where should people go if they want to check out more of your stuff? I mean, God, pretty much everywhere. I've, I've been all over the place, Chris, let me let me tell you. Um, no, but The Atlantic is where I, is my main writing home. They are currently in the middle of sending me to write a long piece about Florida, which is great. I love Florida. I'm uh, in the tank for Florida. It is a great American state, and I 
saw a manatee, I fired a gun, I did everything that you would want to do in Florida. And um, yeah, and that's the kind of decadent journal lifestyle that I'm living at the moment. Fantastic. All right, Helen, thank you. Thank you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.